So what's going on, folks? So, um, you know, recently, um, Freeway Ricky Ross was um, on an interview with uh, Joe Rogan, and you know, he basically was talking about how he didn't believe that a lot of these guys are who they say they are. He was mentioning Jay-Z, how he didn't think Jay-Z was a kingpin that Jay-Z was. Um, You know, he didn't think Jay-Z could have been a successful, uh, couldn't have been a successful dealer. Not a kingpin, not a drug lord. So just to kind of like go through this really quick of a lot of you, if you may not know who Rick Ross is or his story, I mean... You know, you got the show um, Snowfall. Um, you got a lot of people that, what you know, have his name, Freeway, the Philly rapper. You got Rick Ross, Rose. Um, but many taking on his persona, his likeness in their lyrics. So um, he attended, you know, a high school, uh, Susan Miller Dorsey High School in L.A. Uh, was, was, you know, played college, was on a tennis team, but due to him being illiterate, um, it really it prevented him from possibly getting a college scholarship in regards to tennis. So, um, you know, Ross said he, you know, he, he saw, you know, cocaine, crack cocaine as a teenager in the community and really didn't think much of it because it didn't look like the other drugs. Um, the nickname Freeway came from Ross owning properties along Los Angeles Interstate 110, also known as the Harbor Freeway, according to 2013 Esquire magazine article between 1982 and 1989 federal prosecutors estimated Ross bought and resold several metric tons of product with Ross gross revenue claimed to be more than 900 million equivalent of 2.7 billion if we estimated today and profits of almost 300 million during um, the heights of his dealing Ross was said to have sold three million in one day, according to the Oakland Tribune. In the course of his rise, prosecutors estimate that Ross exported several tons of product uh, to New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and elsewhere, and made more than five hundred million between 1983 and 1984. In 1996, Ross was sentenced to life imprisonment uh, under the three strikes law after being convicted for purchasing more than 100 kilograms of product from a federal agent in a sting operation. Later that year, a series of articles by journalist Gary Webb um, in the San Jose Mercury News revealed connections between uh, one of Ross's uh, sources, Danilo Blondin, and the CIA as a part of you, the, the Iran-Contra affair. Having learned to read at the age of 28, during his first stint in prison, Ross spent much of his time behind bars studying the law. He eventually discovered a legal loophole that will lead to his release. Ross' uh, case was brought to federal courts of appeal, which found that the three strikes law had been erroneously applied in order that he be resentenced. His sentence was reduced to 20 years. He was released from federal correctional institution uh, on September 2009. Ross was arrested in October 2015, on suspicion of possessing cash related to sales of illegal drugs, when police discover $100,000 in his possession during a traffic stop, Ross later alleged that he had been racially profiled and stated that he was carrying a large amount of cash for the purchase of a home. Charges were ultimately dropped, and Ross explained he had earned the cash from book sales and speaking fees. I just want to give you the background of, of who this guy is. Um, Ross began... Uh, cocaine after his illiteracy prevented him from earning a tennis scholarship for college. He began spending time with a teacher at a Los Angeles community college who revealed he dealt product and offered Ross a small amount to sell. Ross used his pro- profit to purchase more product to sell, expanding his small operation. Ross eventually began to ask for quantities to sell that exceeded what the teacher was willing to provide, so he turned to find a dealer. The teacher referred Ross to a supplier, Yvonne Argarellis, who offered to keep Ross supplied. Argarellis was able to provide large quantities at a better price, and Ross quickly went from dealing in grams of product to dealing in ounces. About eight months after becoming Ross' supplier, Argarellis was shot in the spine, resulting in months of hospitalization that forced him out of the business. 
His brother-in-law, Henry Corrales, took over the business but was not enthusiastic about the trade and had failed to make any connections of his own to suppliers. Um, uh, an exile and distributor named Danilo Blandon was acquainted with Argarellas and Corrales and thought he did not know him and he did not know him personally, was impressed with the amount of product that Ross was moving. Blandon offered to supply product to Corellis to sell to Ross for a 50-50 split of the profit. Eventually, Corellis lost his appetite for the business uh, and retired, at which point Ross became a direct customer of Blandon. Through his connection to Blandon and Blandon's supplier, Norwin um, Cantorero, Ross was able to purchase uh, significantly reduced rates through his connect. Ross began uh, selling product at $10,000 per kilo, a price well below average while also distributing to the Bloods and Crips street gangs. By 1982, Ross had received his moniker Freeway Ricky and claimed to have sold up to $3 million uh, worth of product per day, purchasing 1,000 pounds, 454 kilos of product a week. Ross initially invested most of his profits in houses and businesses because he feared his mother would catch on to what he was doing if he started spending lavishly on himself. In a jailhouse interview with reporter Gary Webb, Ross said we were hiding our money from our mothers. He invested a portion of the proceeds from his dealing activities into Anita Baker's first album. Um, so his empire with thousands of employees, Ross has said he operated drug sales not only in Los Angeles, but in places across the country, including St. Louis, New Orleans, Texas, Kansas City, Oklahoma, Indiana, Cincinnati, North Carolina, South Carolina, Baltimore, Cleveland, and Seattle. He has said that his most lucrative sales came from the Ohio area. He made similar claims in a 1996 PBS interview. Federal prosecutors estimate that between 1982 and 1989, Ross bought and resold several metrics, tons of a product in 1980 uh, dollars. In 1980 dollars, his gross earnings were said to be in excess of 900 million with a profit of nearly 300 million. As his distribution empire grew to include 42 cities, the price he paid per kilo of, prod of powder dropped from as much as 60,000 as low as 10,000 dollars. Much of Ross's success at evading law enforcement was due to his ring's possession of police scanners and voice scramblers. Furthermore, journalist Gary Webb alleged that the CIA was sponsoring the operation as part of its efforts to finance Contras, giving Ross another level of protection, although this claim has been disputed. Following one drug bust, a Los Angeles County Sheriff remarked that Ross men have better equipment than we have. Um, and then, you know, also, you know, he filed a lawsuit sued rapper Rick Ross filing a copyright infringement lawsuit against Ross in Los Angeles County Superior Court. JC had been called to testify in the lawsuit as he was president of Def Jam when Ross was signed to the label. Ross sought $10 million in compensation in the lawsuit. After the lawsuit was dismissed on July 3rd, 2010, the album Teflon Don was released as scheduled on July 20. A federal judge dismissed his case ruling that it should be refiled in California State Court because if fell under California state law. Ross refiled the case with the state of California while appealing his federal case. Federal appeals upheld the dismissal in 2012. The state case was filed in 2011 in California. Ross refiled in Los Angeles Superior Court with publicity rights claims. Trial was set for 2012. The case was dismissed by a judge in an LA Superior Court. The California state case was updated with a motion in freeway Rick Ross favor as to Warner Brothers records and their use of the name and image Rick Ross in July 2012. A trial was set for 2013 in Freeway Rick Ross versus Rick Ross and Warner Music Group. The California trial court ruled in favor of rapper Rick Ross, allowing him to keep the name. Um, so that's the background and of, of that story. Now, getting to Jay-Z, he said that, you know, Jay-Z wasn't really a, a real uh, dealer. Um, so, you know, we could just really just talk about his early life. You know, um, you know, Jay-Z attended Eli Whitney High School. Um, you know, he dropped out during his sophomore year at Trenton Central High School. According to his interviews, he sold product and was, you know, shot at three times. 
his former friend was sentenced to prison for possession of product uh, known as Jazzy around the neighborhood. He later adopted the stage name, um, you know, Jay-Z. And then we go off his first album. First album, Reasonable Doubt, talked a lot about, um, you know, the background of just basically being a dealer, the thoughts they deal with, um, just trying to get a peace of mind, uh, you know, trying to really understand the perspective and, and give that perspective of what a, what a dealer deals with. Um, and, you know, basically the hustler life and just really just breaking it down of, you know, what comes with that life and what, what, I mean, what, what someone might deal with in, in that regard. So, um, you know, a lot of people call it a landmark album, uh, you know, similar to like the Scarface movie in regards to something that's musically capturing that life. Um, so there we go. Now, let's fast forward to now. I just want to give you the background because a lot of times you guys speak on Freeway Ricky Ross like he's just this hating guy. And I always want you to know that he is definitely certified. Um, and by no means am I condoning the selling the product or whatever it may be. Uh, but that was the cards that were dealt to him and, and, and that's the way he, he moved accordingly. Now, Freeway Ricky Ross is or was a drug lord um, and he was a kingpin. Now, a lot of you are not going to listen to the whole section of what he was saying about Jay-Z, but it was basically saying that Jay-Z is not a kingpin, not, could not have been a serious drug dealer, a serious kingpin if he never got caught. There's no way somebody's going to move enormous amount of weight in America and be black and the authorities don't eventually bring you down. Now, I don't think he's excusing the fact that Jay-Z was possibly a hustler, but that is miles away from being an actual, um, you know, kingpin. And then we also mentioned is that he believes that Jay-Z isn't a successful drug dealer because Ricky Ross was around successful drug dealers and he's trained successful drug dealers and Jay-Z, in his opinion, did not have the attributes. Now, what he means by that is he was given a shot. He was broke, he didn't have no money and a college professor um, ended up giving him some work. And after he saw what he did with a small amount of work, right, that's when Rick Ross came to him and said, man, I need more. And that's when that guy that was helping him out reached out to another dealer that had more weight. And that's why Ricky Ross was able to sell even more. And then he kept going up the ladder. And the reason why he's saying that Jay-Z is not like that is that if a drug dealer sees another drill, drug dealer that, of course, you don't have any issues with, get out of prison, and Ricky Ross got out of prison after 20 years, that individual who knows that uh, person um, is legit, seems like they have the characteristics, seems like they're, they, they're um, you know, suited in their, in their, in the, in the work ethic, uh, in the way they go about doing things, they would just help them out. Not give them everything, but just give them a little bit of something, right? Just so that um, that individual can take that and move it to the next level and beyond. He said Jay-Z's never been that type of individual. He never reached out to him or other kingpins, drug dealers, if Jay-Z is a kingpin. So he says that is something that he don't really have their attributes, right? Um, Faze I Love has said this in the past again. Um, he was on the, the, the Vlad podcast mentioning Jay-Z and saying that Jay-Z was not 
a kingpin. He said he might have been around some people that were some serious dealers, but he doesn't believe that Jay-Z was ever that. Damon Dash recently um, said that he saw a big pimping that Jay-Z was really talking about his lifestyle. Um, I don't know if that's implying that other, some of his other songs were about other people that was in his life. But to Jay-Z fans and to people that have heard Reasonable Doubt and, and call that a classic, in their mindset, when they're hearing that, they think that Jay-Z was a kingpin. But we're hearing Freeway Ricky Ross is someone that was a kingpin saying that Jay-Z is not a kingpin. And then all you're going to hear from people is saying, well, this guy is hating. Damon Dash is hating. Everyone that's hating that has a different viewpoint on Jay-Z. And I, I mean, think about it, though. Maybe there is an issue he might have with Jay-Z of Jay-Z when he went to trial and allowing or signing an artist or doing business with an artist that has the exact name and taking the persona of someone that that's actually who they are and Jay-Z is testifying on their behalf, which I, I, I would expect that he would have to have done being the president of Def Jam at that point, point in time. So there might be a little, um, you know, malice that he might have towards Jay-Z in that regard. And then of him losing a court case to someone that's really taking his whole persona and generating millions. I mean, think about it. I mean, this guy keeps getting um, really treated in a manner that isn't really respectful. It seemed like these a lot of people are getting over on him and making a lot of money off him. The, the snowfall um, show. I mean, they were supposed to consult... Um, he was supposed to be a consultant for the show. John Singleton was supposed to be consulting him and then eventually just left him out of it. But imagine how much money he would have made off of that show. Yes, he's made money off of books and interviews and, and all that, but this is the real thing. This guy went from zero to multi-millionaire someone would say billionaire stats and everybody's able to make money off of him more than he's actually making off of himself I don't look at it as hate I look at it as we live in a society that we call facts hate now there will be many people coming out here well yeah well Jay Z was selling around here a lot of people knew Jay Z was selling this that and the third and I don't think that's the dispute. The dispute is he wasn't selling on the level of a free way Ricky Ross. Because think about this. Even for freeway Ricky Ross to be selling what he did and not having no one coming for him for years, he had to have protection from the CIA, protection from law enforcement. You mean to tell me that Jay-Z, that entire time that he was selling and moving all this weight, that he was smart enough, smarter than these other guys, to not get caught? Hustling, I can see somebody getting away with that. But... Kingpin status? No. Kingpin, kingpin status, it, it will be very tough. It will be a rarity. But Jay-Z has, you know, made various albums about him his, him selling, Reasonable Doubt, uh, American Gangster. And, of course, the people around him have said that he was about that life. 
which I'm not saying he was not about the life of selling. What Freeway Ricky Ross is saying is you couldn't have been extremely successful at it. Because if you were extremely successful as Freeway Ricky Ross was, you would get even more work. I mean, think, think about this man's story. This man was illiterate. Illiterate doing all of this. Generating millions. I mean, could you imagine if he, what he did um, in his life, could you imagine if it was productive? And he had the same opportunities that a Warren Buffett had, that a Mark Zuckerberg had, that a Jeff Bezos had, that a Bill Gates had. Imagine. But from the circumstances and the cards he was dealt, being illiterate, he became a multimillionaire. Then goes to prison based on a three strike rule and teaches himself how to read, then ends up defending himself and end up getting out of jail when he had a life sentence. Then when he gets out, they try to get him again, pull him over when he have $100,000 and then he gets off again. And it's amazing when you see in our community is that these laws are more aggressive towards us. We see these men's in suits breaking the law all day long. The relationships they have with individuals, the things they're involved in, slap on the wrist, even if that. These laws were made to enslave our people. A lot of our black men and women are in jail for nonviolent offenses. And now there's more grace for drug addicts. There was no grace for drug addicts when somebody was on crack or had a cocaine addiction. But now there's so much grace for all these people that are on these drugs because it's affecting other communities. Now we're like, oh, well, maybe jail isn't the way. Or maybe we shouldn't classify um, you know, marijuana. Maybe we shouldn't classify that as a hard drug. After they locked up all these folks that made millions and billions off of folks. Now, this guy should have went to jail for doing something illegal. But can we, are we going to have that same energy for the white collar guys? And the answer is no. These laws are just for us. Jay-Z, what, what, what was, what was, what he did that put him on the map, in my opinion, is he made an album that captured what is the psyche of somebody that is in that life, musically. And that's why it will forever be a classic. It don't matter if he was a kingpin or not. It musically captured what somebody either dealt with firsthand or saw or was around. You know, that's that's the thing. It's like that's his classic. He'll he'll never have another album bigger than that album, in my personal opinion. Don't care if you get Kanye, don't matter, reasonable doubt. Flawless production, the lyrics were everything just meshed. And I think that was the most lyrically sharp he's ever ever been. But I think a lot of people have questions about Jay-Z. See when you're young, and I heard I heard that song when I was younger. 
I heard reasonable doubt when I was probably huh, trying to think. I probably heard reasonable doubt when I was like maybe a teenager. And, it, and, and not saying it came out when I was a teenager, that's when I became familiar with it because the older folks that was around me, they were playing it. And to me, it was like, it was an interesting album in my opinion because I didn't know nothing about what he was talking about. But he captured it in the way where it's like, it made you interested in like wow, like I can remember the beats, I can remember the songs. But after time, when when you get older and you start listening to things over again, you start saying to yourself, "This probably sparked the type of rap that we hear now of people either saying what they went through or saying what they embellishing off of what they went through." Music at the end of the day. I don't know how many albums or songs that are 100% factual. I know these guys out here from, you know, old school guys like Ricky Ross and all that, going like, man, they need, to, they need to say everything they need to do or everything they did. I mean, well, from one standpoint, if they did do that, I mean, that could be held against them in court. And then another thing is, well, people just want the tea. People just want the juice. And the more tea and the more juice and the more stuff that you can share in the context of what's going on in a, in a, in a, in a record, I mean, that's pretty much all people want to hear. They don't want to hear that it was all nice and it was all great. That's why I think a lot of these guys keep tapping into being a part of the street, even if they haven't lived in that street or area for years people can only relate to what they there's a few things people can relate to people can only relate to what they've been through and then the stuff they ain't been through they at least they want to aspire to get to that they can only relate to something of them trying to keep up with the joneses but i don't really think that rick ross is a bitter person I wouldn't say bitter is the word. I would say that here's somebody that did the lead work of his entire life and other people are making more money off it than he is. I think that's what it's all about. And I think that'd be anyone that would have that type of mindset of if you build something from scratch and you built it and it's your story and it's your persona and your name and everything is is the reason why it's popular, why people want to use it. And then somebody can literally walk around and they can copyright or copyright your name as their rap name, which you can call yourself whatever, but make money off of your likeness. Your actual story. So now, years down the line, somebody can do the same thing with Jay-Z. They can call themselves Sean Carter. And take on the likeness and, and probably generate more money off his name than he will. See, the thing you have to understand, I'm going to get out of here. The reason why Rihanna is, 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 is a billionaire, the reason why Jay-Z is a billionaire, the reason why... Um, I'm trying to think of somebody else. Um, but any of these guys are billionaires because they are influencers. It ain't like the typical, you know, you know, you created a product or a service and that made you a billionaire. No, what helped them out is they are already big in their music. So now I can hand you anything and it's going to sell like hotcakes. Those are influencers. That's like that's what people do now. It's like an influencer on TikTok. 
influencer on any platform. They got like a million followers or this, that, and the third. At that point is I'm just, you already got a following. You already got a base. So whatever I hand you is going to be taken to the next level um, because you already got that. Jay-Z had to have become a billionaire. He got a, over a million people every time he dropped the album supporting him. So now it's like, okay, sell some liquor, sell some shoes, sell this, sell that. It's not off of reading balance sheets. It isn't off reading income statements. It's not off reading financial reports. It's not off of having a competitive advantage. And that is not why these guys are billionaires. It's billionaires because they became successful in the music industry and now all these labels, or I mean, all these industries want to partner with them and put their face on things, and that's what's generating their revenue. This guy, Freeway Ricky Ross, he built it from zero to 900 million to a billion. Now, you might not agree with what he did and say he's unethical himself and drugs and all that. Well, are you have that same energy for these pharmaceutical companies that are making trillions of dollars and have nothing but addicts all over the world. So what, what's your beef? Your beef. So your beef is he did it illegally, but you have no beef with people that's doing this legally. They have legal. They're legal drug dealers, and they have legal addicts. 